to protect you. You can't even protect yourselves. This week on At The Movies, Leonardo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe team up in the CIA thriller, Body of Lies. Syracuse just may have found their next great halfback. Dennis Quaid coaches a historic Heisman Trophy candidate in the Express. I'm the Bill Maher travels the world searching for what's wrong with religion. Butler and Tandy Newton navigate London's criminal underworld in Guy Ritchie's latest rock and roll. You're working with a guy named Hani Salam. I have one rule with you. Never lie to me. All you gotta do is trust me. How the hell do you expect me to run an operation when you're running a side operation? Leonardo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe track down terrorists for the CIA. I'm Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies. And I'm Ben Lyons from E! Entertainment. Our first movie is Body of Lies. Russell Crowe has teamed with director Ridley Scott four times over the years, including Gladiator, which won the Aussie and Oscar. This time, Leonardo DiCaprio is added to the mix in Body of Lies, the latest film to explore the war on terror. DiCaprio plays Roger Ferris, a CIA operative roaming the Middle East who discovers a terrorist cell while working out of Jordan. You're blown. It's chat. Well, if I'm blown, Ed, that means you should have sent a team there the minute Nazar got shot. But you didn't send a team, did you? Did you? Well, not since we've been talking, Ferris. You and I were going to that safe house, you understand, right now. While the film is deceptively being sold as the teaming of DiCaprio and Crow, the two stars spend most of the film communicating via cell phone, only sharing the screen face to face in two, maybe three scenes tops. I thought Honey wanted to kill me. Oh, don't exaggerate. Honey don't want to kill you. He likes you. He likes you a lot. And who is he going to get over there better for him than you? You know, 10 years ago, I could have beat the crap out of you. Taking a shot when you had the chance. Maybe right? I should have. The film feels flat, uninspired, filled with holes from start to finish. Disappointing, to say the least, despite typically strong performances from DiCaprio and Crow. As hard as it is to pass on these talented actors pairing with an incredible director, save your money and skip it. Buy a ticket, go see the movie, take a friend. I thought a terrific movie, a textured, layered movie, a complicated movie about the war on terror with two terrific performances and a terrific director. A, a terrific director, and yes, Ridley Scott, one of the all-time greats, but in this film, he doesn't really get to show off his camera work. I didn't find the action sequences incredibly compelling. I do have a problem with Leonardo DiCaprio blending in in the Middle East only because he grows his beard there out a little bit. There are Americans in Jordan. Just, I found the film to be overtly complicated. Just because it's really dense and layered doesn't necessarily mean it's good. And I never really found the connection between Crow and DiCaprio because Crow's off in another movie on his cell phone the whole time. Crow is, uh, is, is the character in this movie that says that no matter what we do, if it's for the greater good, if we kill innocent people, it doesn't matter. DiCaprio goes along with it and then along the way realizes is this right? Is this the way we should be doing it? And I love the idea that sort of there is there is moral ambiguity here. That not everybody, there's not just a sort of ironclad hero and an evil villain. It's not villain. good Every, versus evil. No, everybody is mixed up. I think we've understood that now from so many films about the war on terror. Where Most they, of them They do good. try and humanize the terrorist plight, and there are obviously bad people working for the yeah. government, people who lie. But the real problem with me is that just because it's Leonardo DiCaprio, I feel like a studio has to say, well, let's put a love interest in there. When it came upon that she might be sacrificed, he wasn't going to do it anymore. It made perfect sense to me. I thought it was terrific. I felt it was just added on because it's Leo and women think he's dreamy. Next film. You know, I've done some research. I've crunched the numbers, Ben, and it turns out three out of every seven movies are about the apocalypse. I bet you didn't know that. We're obsessed with the end of civilization. Thankfully, City of Ember has a more interesting take on the post-apocalyptic world than this summer's Babylon AD. Though, honestly, that's not saying much. Set water wheel one to full thrust. It's stuck. The premise here is pretty intriguing. As the world was ending, leaders built a city totally underground, a city that eventually would be filled with people who knew nothing of the sorrow and destruction above. But as a precaution, they left instructions for how to get out in a lockbox. Who doesn't miss the 2000 election, by the way? It's a lockbox that can't be opened for 200 years. It's mine. May I look at that box, Lena? Why? What's inside the box, Lena? Box. Give it to me. It's not yours. Give me the box! No! Get it from her, now. 
But as that deadline approaches, the city of Ember is falling apart. Its generator and source of light is failing, and the city government, led by its mayor, played, I thought, rather uninspiringly by Bill Murray, is corrupt and unresponsive. My problem is that this intriguing premise eventually gives way in the film's final act to a kid's adventure movie where the two main characters, both teens, try to escape Ember. It's an unfortunate end to a promising movie, Ben. I say skip it. Finally, we agree on yeah. something. I say skip it as well. This movie needed 20 more million dollars and it needed Guillermo del Toro because it doesn't yeah, well. feel grand in its size. It feels cheap. And when you see films like Harry Potter or The Lord of the Rings or fantastical films that are for the entire family to enjoy, it, it really makes you long for something greater. Those, those films are rich, full films with attention to detail. This looked like it was shot on sound stages. It's got an interesting premise, but as you said, does not go beyond that. And you said your problem with the film is that it turns into a kid's adventure. I just wanted the movie to be a kid's adventure. It's bleak, it's brown, it's dark. Yeah, I just thought for, for me in the first hour, I thought this is an interesting premise. Where are they going to go with this? And again, and then all of a sudden it was this kid's adventure movie, which I might have liked to see too, but it's, they were not the same movie in any way. And no. it ended up being an incredibly simplistic solution to a complicated problem. Ultimately, it didn't move me in any way yeah. to think about the world differently. And it was kind of flat, visually at least. I agree. All right, coming up next, Dennis Quaid coaches The Express. And later, Guy Ritchie's gangster thriller, Rock and Roll. There's no school like the old school, and I'm their master. Ease up, Davis. What are you smiling at? This fine institution has given you three hots and a cot. I do not intend to let them waste their money. Get them up. Come on. Come on. Right about now, I bet you're wondering what happened to that nice gentleman that visited your house and begged you to come here, huh? Let's go. That was a scene from our next film, The Express. Now, the key to a great football movie is to be more than just a movie about football greats. Sure, the game sequences need to be authentic, but to fully capture an audience, a football movie needs to be about life, not just the big game. These people down here, they're dug in. They're setting their ways. No, we are coach, that, you're just hiding behind those words. I have That's a responsibility not how it has to, be. to my team. Yes, Davis. Jack Art and me, we're all a part of your team. What? The Express tells the story of Ernie Davis, portrayed valiantly by Rob Brown. The first African American to win the Heisman Trophy, Davis never played in the NFL. Dennis Quaid plays famed coach Ben Schwartzwalder, who along with football legend Jim Brown, recruits Davis to Syracuse during the racially turbulent 1950s. Do you feel added pressure to represent change? Uh, well, we uh, don't concern ourselves with politics. We're just here to play a great football game and take home a championship. To be honest, Mr. Page, when I'm out on that field, I only think about winning the game. But that doesn't mean I don't know the color of my own skin. Davis was more than just a talented running back, and that's what makes this more than just another feel-good sports movie. During his days at Syracuse, he became an outspoken voice in the fight for civil rights. The Express sheds light on an important life of a forgotten American hero. So football fan or not, definitely be sure to see it. Yeah, you know, Ben, sports movies can so easily be trite and maudlin, and uh, this one I thought was largely inspiring without any of those problems. Uh, I agree, I think you should, uh, I, think, I think people should see it. You know, we've seen these images of race in football before and something like Remember the Titans, but they're still powerful and they're incredibly explosive on screen. And This is a biopic. Yes, you're not aware maybe of this guy's life, especially for younger audiences, but here you learn about it and it seems like a larger uh, life of importance. And the football scenes are great, so you don't lose any yeah. interest in the football. But to see this young man who can win the, be the MVP of the championship game and then not be allowed to stay at the same hotel with his friends and his teammates is incredibly inspiring and difficult to watch even at times. Well, we're not talking that long ago. We're talking about during the Eisenhower administration. And obviously a lot of people know that history. Uh, but to see it and to have already identified with these characters sort of made it resonate a little bit more. Dennis Quaid, it's fun to watch him as the coach because we've seen him as the football player so many times. Right. And Rob Brown really knocks it out of the park. This is a kid who played football in college, Division Three, really but is an athlete and really gives a great performance. A young actor who I wish would work more. And I love seeing Omar Benson Miller, who plays his lineman in the film. And from Miracle at St. Anna. Miracle at St. Anna, a great fall for Omar as well. Yeah, I thought Rob Brown did a nice job, and there's an innocence to him and an innocence to Ernie Davis that I think uh, that it makes it work. Dennis Quaid has been in some terrific sports movies. I mean, I don't care much for any given Sunday, but, you know, everybody's All-American and the rookie. And This also, by the way, afforded people an opportunity to remember a time when uh, Syracuse University actually won football games. Yes, only the magic of the movies, right? All right, well, coming up next, Bill Maher looks for religion in religions. And later... Gerard Butler and sex, thugs, and rock and roll. We got your boy. You might want to hose him down. He smells like a rotten goat.
We're making a documentary about religion. Oh, boy. And why doesn't he just obliterate the devil and therefore get rid of evil in the world? He will. He will. Yeah, What's he up. waiting for? In political circles, it is simultaneously one of the most anticipated and most feared movies of the fall. Not W, but Bill Maher's documentary, Religious, a scathing attack on the lack of common sense in organized religion. Many will call this the most offensive movie they've ever seen, though most of those people won't actually see it. Others will call it brilliant, but first and foremost, it's truly funny. You're a senator. It worries me that people are running my country who believe in a talking snake. You don't have to pass an IQ test to be in the Senate, though. <laughs> Starting with Catholicism and ending with Islam, the film is Mars personal indictment of every faith, and he skewers each one with a surprisingly endearing folksy style. Generally, not always, but generally, he doesn't condemn the regular folks he interviews, but calmly and often rather pleasantly points out what, to him, makes them crazy and ultimately, therefore, dangerous. How we define what is crazy or not crazy about religions is, is ultimately up to how we define crazy. You start disputing my God and, and you've got a problem. I think this is an important movie challenging many beliefs many of us are unwilling to talk about. Mainly, though, you'll laugh a lot. Please see it, even if it makes you uncomfortable. That is my take on the film. Now it's time for our new segment, the Critics Roundup. We've invited film experts from around the country to join in on the discussion. Joining us today, Matt Singer from IFC, Tony Senecal, she's the entertainment reporter for WNYW, that's our affiliate in New York City, and Joe Layden, the film critic for Variety. Welcome, everybody, and we'll begin with you. Matt Singer, see it, skip it, or read it. Well, Ben, I think if you walk in expecting to find it hilarious or expecting to find it, you know, blasphemous, I think you're going to be right either way. Personally, I enjoyed it. I laughed. I say see it. Tony Senecal. All right. I think it was absurdly amusing, moved to outrageously entertaining. If you are an atheist or agnostic, I definitely say see it. And Joe Layden. It's sharp. It's insightful. It's snarky. It's sarcastic. It's Bill Maher. I liked it a lot. I laughed a lot. Go see it. Uh, Matt Singer, do you think Bill Maher went uh, far enough here, or did he need to push the envelope even further? Well, it's interesting. I think different people would have different things to say about it. If they were a person of faith, they might say he went way too far, he's being outrageous, he's being offensive. On the other hand, if somebody was a skeptic, they might feel the opposite. They may, might want uh, Bill Maher to maybe talk to some you know, people who are in theology that have thought about these things a little more than the people we see in the movie who are very much uh, just believers. He spends a lot of time interviewing people who disagree with him. Does that strategy mean that he'll be able to convert anybody who watches this movie? If you're a believer, I don't think this movie is going to talk you out of your belief because you got to remember that, you know, it is called belief. It's not called certainty. The uh, Tony uh, Seneca, let me ask you, do you think there's a religious audience uh, anywhere in this movie? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I think they'll probably be picketing outside, but I don't think they'll actually buy a ticket and go inside and see it. I think they're <laughs> going to be completely against this movie. And I think that Bill, in his effort to, you know, find answers to all these big questions, I don't think he was looking to convert anyone. Like, like you guys said, he was kind of setting up people to make fun of them. I think he, I, I disagree with you there. I think he is definitely hoping to convert people. I mean, we all, you guys seem to agree that he has no chance of actually succeeding. But I think his hope was not just to make fun of people, but to make people think about I think his hope was this. to make funny. I think his hope was to make it funny. Uh, that he's a comedian. Well, I don't think that, you know, he, he really feels that deeply religious people are going to come see this movie because, let's face it, uh, what I call the professionally outraged have learned their lessons from, you know, trying to launch boycott campaigns against uh, John Goddard's Hail Mary or Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. I mean, they protested these movies. Both of those movies made more money than anybody expected. Matt, <laughs> did you think it was uh, equal opportunity in its uh, dismissiveness? of all faiths? Uh, it does kind of get some time in with a lot of different religions. I think fundamentalist Christians are clearly the main, the main target of the movie. They get the most well, in abuse power. in the movie. Um, but th there, there is enough in there for different religions. Uh, the thing is about all these different religions is that Bill Maher can walk into any comedy club in America and say the word Scientology and get a laugh just by saying the word because people think it's so silly and absurd. But what I think the movie does a nice job of pointing out is that that's a perspective of someone who doesn't believe in it. And from, from someone who does believe it, it's not silly. And uh, anyone looking from the outside of any religion can probably poke holes in any of them. I want to direct the uh, final question here to Tony Senecal. It has to do with the uh, director, Larry Charles, who also brought mm -hmm. us Borat. Similarly uh, offensive, also very funny. Yes. Uh, any chance that religious have 
has anything like Borat's uh, box office success? I don't think so, but I think that they cleverly use the same tool, and that's they take these people that have no idea kind of what's in store for them and really kind of make fun of them. But I think the movie was as funny as Borat. All right, guys, so it's uh, unanimous. We all say see religious again. Thank you guys uh, for your opinions. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Coming up next, Gerard Butler, Tom Wilkinson, and Jeremy Piven vie for millions in rock and roll. We like to insult people. Okay, looking at movies out now on DVD. Adam Sandler stars and You Don't Mess with the Zohan. M. Night Shyamalan is back with The Happening. Richard Jenkins stars in the fantastic The Visitor. And Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin continue to make us laugh in the best sitcom on TV, 30 Rock, season two. Absolutely, I agree with that. Time now for our next film. Now, throughout his career, director Guy Ritchie has been infatuated with the London underworld, having helmed tough guy flicks like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, and Revolver. His latest effort, Rock and Rolla, may be his best yet. As once again, we are taken on an intense and stylized ride along with a collection of memorable British gangsters and lowlifes as only Richie can create. <clears throat> now, now, boys, do as you're told. Put the bags in the car, walk away, and keep smiling. Sorry, is this a robbery? Yes, it is a robbery. Yeah, give me a piece. When a Russian businessman scams his way to millions of pounds, the shadiest blokes in town become intrigued and vie for their cut of the action. I'm going to ask you a question, just one question. You're going to give me a name. And if it's the right name, I'm going to send you home warm and dry in a fresh set of clothes. If it's the wrong name, you'll be fed to the crayfish. <laughs> Once the plot and the characters are established, you will lose yourself in the collection of oddball misfits led by Gerard Butler and Idris Elba, along with Tandy Newton as a sexy art collector, Tom Wilkinson as the heavy, and a star-making performance from Toby Kebbell as the rock and roller himself. Guns, gangsters, and Richie's unique style and tone make his latest picture just plain fun. I say see it. You know, this movie is so similar to the movies you mentioned, uh, you know, Snatch and, and Lock, Stock and Two Smoke and Barrel, uh, but it doesn't matter. They're great, and this is great. This is a wonderful movie. I agree. See it. It's a lot of fun. You know, it requires you to be very proactive, as in all of Guy Ritchie's movies, yeah. to get into the dialogue, and you might miss a few words here and there because yep. addiction is so intense. I love the sort of theme that these old school gangsters are sort of have to deal with the new world order. And I mean, it turns out no longer it's not women or numbers running, it's real estate. And they want to get into the real estate racket. These guys are adapting, or the world of crime is going to pass them by. And the world of movies. Movies is adapting to the new school of actors, not just like yeah. older gangsters and younger gangsters, but like we said, another Tom Wilkinson ludicrous movie. And this <laughs> cast on paper sounds ridiculous, but it all comes together. And I think why the movie really works is because of Toby Kebbell, a part that could have been really overacted, and it wasn't. He makes the movie. You mentioned him, but uh, Idris Elba from The Wire. One of my dynamite. favorite actors. He's about to become a household name, so go see him in yeah, this. About time. Yeah. Want to know what you can't miss this weekend? Stay tuned for my three to six. Oh my God, TK, you're so lucky. Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by... With kids, teens, pets, and husbands. Ever wonder how you can keep your house clean? Call today about our $99 special. Call 1-800-STEAMER. Stanley Steamer gets your home cleaner. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's Magnificent Mile on Water Tower Square. Okay, time now for my three to see. My picks for the three movies you have to check out this weekend. I'll start with the movie we just reviewed, Guy Ritchie's Rock and Roller. A funny, smart, fast, surprising, and clever movie about old-school British bad guys fighting the new economy. Number two, I'm going to go with The Lucky Ones with Tim Robbins, Rachel McAdams, and Michael Pena. This is just great storytelling, an authentic road trip movie about three Iraq War vets thrown together on a cross-country drive. Each of their stories has depth, drama, and humor. And at number one, Ben's going to disagree, but Flash of Genius. Greg Kinnear is perfectly flawed as the guy who invented the intermittent windshield wiper and then tries to take on Ford. This could be a cliched David versus Goliath story. Instead, it feels totally original and genuine. And you can get my three to see exclusively on our website, at themoviestv.com. 
All right, time now for a recap of the movies on this week's show. We split on Body of Lies. I say skip it, Mank says to see it. We both say you should see The Express, and we both agree that you can skip City of Ember. We also agree that you should definitely see Rock and Rolla, and The Roundup agrees to see Religious. That's it for now. Remember, though, we are always online at atthemoviestv.com. We'll leave you with a quick look at some of the movies coming up on our next show, and until then, we'll see you at the movies. Who do you think you are? Kennedy, you're a bush. Act like one. Don't ever be afraid. We are enough. Desmond, the doctor will see you now. It's fruit crepe fever. Sweet cream cheese, luscious fruit, and delectable crepes. Only at IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. And I created Amugo to help support the healthy immune systems of Hollywood stars. Immune support on the go. The official immune support product of the Hollywood Movie Awards. A beautiful princess, a heroic prince, and a wicked dragon. Disney's classic adventure, Sleeping Beauty. Rated G. New on Platinum DVD and Blu-ray today. Snore Stop. Proven effective to stop or reduce the symptoms of snoring. Available in spray and tablets at a store near you. Snore Stop. It works.